Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Stephanie Fassler and I'm the International Affairs Program Director for the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. On behalf of the Council, I welcome you to this Author Series event and World Affairs Today program. In November 2013, an accord was signed in Geneva, Switzerland between the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, Germany, and Iran. This agreement was a preliminary one which would set the path for a more comprehensive deal on Iran's nuclear program and ambitions. This agreement came at a time when there was little hope for a resolution to the crisis. Both sides seemed entrenched in their respective positions. However, diplomacy and nego negotiation, conventional wisdom said, were the best ways to resolve the crisis. As the alternative, a military strike would be catastrophic. In the six months since the accord was signed, both sides have taken steps to demonstrate their commitment to the preliminary deal and to reach a new one in the future. Iran has reduced or halted its, some of its uranium stocks and agreed to allow international inspectors to its facilities. The signatories have lifted some of the sanctions which have crippled Iran's economy. The current nego negotiations are a continual exercise in trust between the parties involved. Trust that Iran's activities will become acceptably transparent and trust that the other signatories will keep their word. Given their in-depth nature, what happens if these talks fail to produce the comprehensive agreement that is desired? Again, many have ruled out military action as being as bad, if not worse, than Iran attaining a nuclear weapon. But what are the alternatives to diplomacy or the seemingly endless stalemate that has existed since November? Matthew Kronig, author of Time to Attack, The Looming Iranian Nuclear Threat, challenges the assumption that a military strike is out of the question, as well as some other commonly held policy wisdoms related to the Iran nuclear program. Military he ac action, he argues, should not be discarded as an option. Matthew Kronig is a nuclear proliferation specialist and internationally recognized authority on Iran's nuclear program. He has worked as a researcher and teacher at various universities in the United States before accepting a Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship in 2010. Through the fellowship, he became an advisor on Iran policy in the office of the Department of the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon, and in 2011, a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow at CFR. His previous book, Exporting the Bomb, was published in 2010, and his articles have appeared in the Washington Post, The National Interest, and Foreign Policy. Most notable is his February 2012 article in Foreign Affairs, which became the basis for his current book. Matthew is an associate professor and the International Fields Chair in the Department of Government at Georgetown University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brent Scowcroft Center on International Security at the Atlantic Council. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Koenig. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Stephanie. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here at the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. Uh, and to be here tonight talking about my new book, A Time to Attack the Looming Iranian Nuclear Threat. Uh, now, before I talk about what the book is about, I'd like to talk a little bit about what the book is not. Um, the book does not argue that we should take immediate military action. Uh, the book does not argue that the military option is our best option. It uh, doesn't argue that it should be our first option. I think some people see the title of the book and jump to the wrong conclusion. Uh, rather, I argue that we should solve the Iranian nuclear challenge through diplomacy, if at all possible. And there are no serious experts who disagree with this uh, position. Uh, everyone agrees uh, that we should try to solve the, the problem through diplomacy. Nobody's saying we should take immediate military action. Nobody's arguing that we should just give up and acquiesce to a nuclear-armed Iran. Uh, since there's so much agreement on that question, uh, however, it's, it's not really an interesting one. Uh, the more interesting question 
And I think, uh, from a foreign policy perspective, the more important question is what happens if diplomacy fails? If diplomacy fails to stop Iran uh, from building nuclear weapons, uh, are we prepared to live uh, with a nuclear-armed Iran with the threats that would pose for decades to come? And if not, are we prepared to take military action to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons? So the argument of my book and the argument I've been making for several years now is that we should try to solve this through diplomacy, but that if diplomacy fails, we should be prepared to take, uh, conduct a limited military strike on Iran's key nuclear facilities. And while it's a bad option in many ways, it's less bad than acquiescing to a nuclear-armed Iran and living with the threats posed by a nuclear-armed Iran for decades to come. The second thing the book is not is controversial. At least in my view, this argument is not controversial. Rather, it, it simply presents the stated U.S. policy for addressing the Iranian nuclear challenge. Uh, President Obama and other administration officials have said several times that a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable and that the United States will do whatever it takes, including use military action to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons. Uh, so I don't believe the argument of the book at this point is controversial. Uh, there was a point when it was controversial. Uh, as Stephanie mentioned, in 2010, I worked as an advisor. 2010, 2011, I worked as an advisor on Iran policy. Uh, that's why I first uh, started to come to this conclusion. And as Stephanie also mentioned, in 2012, I wrote an article in, in Foreign Affairs where I made this argument public for the first time. Uh, and in that time, it was controversial because the U.S. government, the Obama administration, hadn't taken a public stand on this issue. And you had many prominent analysts, like Fareed Zakaria, arguing that if diplomacy fails, we should simply learn to live with a nuclear-armed Iran and deter and contain it just like we deterred and contained the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, so when I wrote my foreign affairs article, there were many uh, people who disagreed strongly with me in uh, opinion pieces, uh, in public debates, including a public debate here at the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. Uh, but then only a few weeks later, President Obama came to my rescue. Uh, in March 2012, President Obama uh, gave an interview with Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic, where he laid out uh, his position for the first time that he would do whatever it took to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, that a nuclear-armed Iran was unacceptable said not only that our policy is not to contain a nuclear-armed Iran, but said that it wasn't even possible, uh, said that a uh, nuclear-armed Iran, quote, cannot be contained, uh, end quote. So some people dismiss this as, as political rhetoric, uh, trying to look tough. Uh, others question whether Obama would really be willing to do it. Uh, but his top officials, uh, Dennis Ross, who was his top official at the White House on Middle East policy for the first few years of the administration, Gary Seymour, who was his top WMD uh, official at the White House for the first few years of the administration, both say matter-of-factly that if it comes to that point, the president will be willing to use force, and I, I quote them uh, both in the book. Um, so over the past two years or so, I think the establishment position on this question has done a near 180-degree turn, and it's shifted so much that now those who suggest that we can live with a nuclear-armed Iran are the ones who are dismissed uh, as extremists. Uh, Rand Paul recently got himself in political hot water just for suggesting that deterring and containing a nuclear-armed Iran should be on the table as an option. Uh, so as I see it, what, what's happened over the past couple of years is essentially the foreign policy establishment has caught up with this argument that I've been making uh, for several years. And I would like to think that my work and my arguments have played at least some part in bringing that shift about. So in sum, uh, the book uh, is not arguing the military option uh, is, should be the first option, but that it should be a last resort if necessary to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. And second, I don't view this as controversial. Rather, it presents America's stated approach for dealing with the problem. Okay. So that's enough about what the book is not. Uh, what is the book about? Uh, well, in the back of the book, I, there's an endorsement from uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman. Uh, I admire Ambassador Edelman a lot, and one of the things, uh, so I'm very pleased to have his endorsement, and what he says on the back of the book is that this is, quote, the most thorough book-length examination of the issues involved in assessing the Iranian nuclear challenge. And that endorsement um, uh, means a lot to me, in, in part because that's really what I was trying to do when I set out to write this book. Uh, I'd been thinking about the Iranian nuclear issue all day, every day, for uh, several years. I felt like I had a lot of information that I wasn't able to convey in, in the foreign affairs article and other short writing. And so I wanted to uh, get the information out there, and I tried to write it for uh, everyone who is interested in this issue, regardless of your political predisposition, regardless of what you thought uh, the best way for addressing the, the Iranian nuclear challenge is, if you came in with an idea of what the best way is to, to address it. Um, so that's what I try to do in the book, really provide a guide to the general public, policymakers, journalists, academics, anyone who wants to learn more about the Iranian nuclear challenge. Uh, so in the book, I do three things. First, I talk about the history of Iran's nuclear program. 
Second, I talk about all of the policy options available for addressing the issue. And third and finally, I talk about what the resolution of the Iranian nuclear challenge will mean for the future of international order. So what I'd like to do tonight is just take a little bit of time to talk about each of those three things. Uh, so first on the history. Uh, as many of you may know, Iran's nuclear program began uh, with a nuclear cooperation agreement with the United States uh, in the 1950s under an Atoms for Peace agreement. Uh, the United States helped Iran set up a nuclear research reactor. Uh, throughout the 1960s and 1970s, the United States was negotiating with uh, the Shah and the Shah's government to uh, help Iran develop a, a nuclear energy program. Uh, and many people look back at this history and say, well, the United States is inconsistent, if not downright hypocritical in its approach to nonproliferation, because it was willing to help the Shah with his nuclear program back then, was willing to help the Shah acquire nuclear weapons, some people even argue. Uh, so it was good enough for the Shah, but not for the mullahs. The United States has uh, changed its position. Uh, but actually, what I argue in the book is the United States has been remarkably consistent in its approach to nonproliferation with Iran and elsewhere. Uh, our, our approach has always been to encourage the peaceful uses of nuclear energy, uh, nuclear technology, including for nuclear energy, but to resist its military applications. And that was our policy with the Shah, and that's our policy uh, today with, with Iran. We are willing to allow Iran to have peaceful nuclear technology, but we don't want Iran to build nuclear weapons. Uh, so these peaceful nuclear uh, discussions with the Shah uh, came to an abrupt end in 1979 with the Iranian Revolution. A uh, new government uh, came into power, anti-American government really shifted Iranian domestic politics, Iran's relations with the rest of the world, Iran's relations with the United States. Uh, so those nuclear negotiations came to an end. Iran also, under the Shah, had had peaceful nuclear cooperation agreements with other Western powers. Those were torn up. Uh, and at the beginning, Iran's new leaders weren't that interested in nuclear technology either. Iran's first supreme leader, Ayatollah Khomeini, said that uh, acquiring nuclear weapons were, was, was against the tenets of Islam. Uh, but he would change his mind in the 1980s. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Iran fought a devastating war with its neighbor Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And in the war, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons many times against Iranian uh, forces. Uh, so at the end of uh, the 1980s, as the war was coming to an end, uh, the Supreme Leader uh, changed his mind. And in fact, in a, in a letter to supporters explaining his decision to uh, sign a ceasefire with Saddam Hussein, uh, something he really didn't want to do. He called it drinking from the poisoned chalice. It was so bitter, signing a, a, peace, a ceasefire with his bitter enemy. Um, but in this letter to his supporters, he said that Iran's military position was hopeless at the time, that he had no alternative, but that he looked forward to resuming the war with, quote, atomic weapons, which will be the necessity of war at that time. So this is 1988, that we get an explicit interest from Iran's top leader in developing nuclear weapons. So it was about at that time that representatives from Iran began meeting with A.Q. Khan, uh, this uh, uh, Pakistani nuclear scientist who you may have read about. He was in the news a lot about 10 years or so ago. Uh, A.Q. Khan transferred essentially these do-it-yourself atomic bomb kits to Iran, Libya, and North Korea. And so Iran really got a jump start on its program because of this Pakistani scientist. Received centrifuges, centrifuge designs. Uh, we think it m he might have, the Iranians might have also received weapons designs. So throughout the 1990s and early 2000s, the United States uh, suspected that Iran might be pursuing a nuclear weapons program. Uh, but all doubt was removed in 2002, when an Iranian resistance group announced that Iran was building two secret nuclear facilities. Uh, a secret nuclear facility at Natanz, uh, an underground uranium enrichment facility, and a heavy water plutonium producing reactor at Iraq, A-R-A-K. Uh, so these weren't the kind of peaceful uh, technologies, innocent technologies that the United States had provided before, like research reactors. These were two facilities that were tailor-made for making material for nuclear weapons. Uh, so at this point, the Iranian nuclear crisis began, and we've been dealing with it uh, ever since for the past uh, 12 years. So after talking about the, the history of the program, and I go through and do talk about the, the election of President Rouhani and the interim deal struck in November that Stephanie talked about, uh, after doing that, I talk about where we stand today. Uh, how close is Iran to having nuclear weapons? Does Iran want nuclear weapons? And so something I teach my undergraduates at Georgetown University is that in order for nuclear weapons to happen, or nuclear proliferation to happen, uh, you ha there's a supply side and a demand side, and those things have to come together. On the supply side, the country must have the ability to build nuclear weapons, and on the demand side, it must have uh, the will to produce them. Uh, so in the book, I go through and talk about the supply and, and the demand. So uh, first, let's talk about the supply. How close is Iran to having a nuclear weapons capability? Uh, 
Well, in order to build nuclear weapons, Iran has to do three things. Uh, first, it has to acquire uh, enough fissile, uh, weapons-grade fissile material to form the core of the nuclear device to fuel it. That can be either highly enriched uranium or plutonium. Uh, second, Iran has to be able to form that into an explosive device, uh, the nuclear warhead. And then third, it needs to have some way to deliver that to an opponent. Uh, ballistic missiles, aircraft, submarine launch ballistic missiles are the uh, platforms that advanced nuclear powers use. use. Um, so some people look at that timeline, those three things, and say, well, we have years to solve this problem. Uh, but that's misleading because really all that matters is the first stage. And the reason that's all that matters is because right now uh, the United States, the international community, if necessary, uh, could take military action, could destroy those nuclear facilities to prevent Iran from producing weapons-grade fissile material. Uh, but once Ron Iran gets the material, the game's over. Iran could move that material anywhere. Uh, we wouldn't know where it is. It could be uh, beyond the reach of our best bunker-busting munitions. And at that point, our only option would be to pray that Iran doesn't build nuclear weapons. Uh, so if we're serious about keeping all options on the table, serious about doing whatever it takes to stop Iran from building nuclear weapons, then our real red line has to be the production of at least one bomb's worth of weapons-grade fissile material. So you might hear in uh, public discussions, Iran's two months away or six months away. Uh, those are what those estimates are, uh, estimates for how long it would take Iran to enrich enough uranium for its first nuclear weapon. Uh, so how long uh, would it take? Uh, well, right now the best estimates are after the interim deal and after Iran put these uh, curbs in place as part of the interim deal, the best estimates are is if, that if the Supreme Leader made the decision right now to dash to its first nuclear weapon, it would take roughly two to three months. Um, now, if we get uh, a comprehensive nuclear deal, the comprehensive deal would reduce Iran's capabilities, it would extend that timeline, but not by much. Uh, a comprehensive deal, it's estimated, would extend that timeline to about six months. So even if we get a comprehensive deal, Iran would still be six months away, in the worst case scenario, from uh, having the ability to produce nuclear weapons. So uh, in short, on the supply side, Iran is almost there. Iran uh, is close to having the ability to produce nuclear weapons. Uh, what about on the demand side? Uh, does Iran want nuclear weapons? So we often hear uh, in public debates, we often hear it reported in the media, uh, that the international community fears that Iran's trying to build nuclear weapons, but that Iran claims it's only interested in a peaceful nuclear energy program. And I'm often disappointed that it's reported that way. It's kind of told as a he said, she said story. Um, so what I do in the book is say, well, let's just treat this as social scientists. Uh, I'm a social scientist by training. I'm a political scientist. We have two hypotheses. One, that Iran wants nuclear energy. Uh, two, that Iran wants nuclear power. And let's look at the evidence and uh, see what the evidence uh, supports, which hypothesis is most consistent with the evidence. And uh, so I go through and, and look at the evidence. And what I show is there are about 14 reasons, 14 things that Iran's doing that makes absolutely no sense for an energy program and really only makes sense uh, to build nuclear weapons. Uh, and this makes sense given Iran's strategic goals. Iran explicitly says that its goals are uh, to first continue to, uh, uh, for this regime to continue to exist, pr to protect this theocratic regime. Uh, second, uh, that it wants to be able to deter foreign attack, to be able to deter an attack from Israel or from the United States. And third, Iran's leaders explicitly say that uh, they want Iran to be the most dominant state in the Middle East. Uh, so if those are your goals, acquiring nuclear weapons makes a lot of sense. Acquiring nuclear weapons allows you to deter foreign attack because you can threaten to retaliate with nuclear war. Uh, acquiring nuclear weapons helps you to become the most dominant state in the Middle East. Having a nuclear energy program, having a few nuclear facilities uh, don't help you uh, to do those things. Uh, so in short, I believe uh, Iran's leaders want nuclear weapons and they're close to having them. Uh, so we have a problem. Um, so what are the various uh, options we have for addressing the problem? Uh, in the book, I go through uh, all of the options, and I see really three options as the most viable. Uh, first, diplomacy. Second, deterring and containing a nuclear-armed Iran. Or third, taking military action. I think these are really the only three options. Um, but before I get to those options, I have a chapter on what I call the non-starters, uh, the options that sometimes people put forward but that really won't work. Because some people look at the three real options and say, well, diplomacy might not work, but these other two options of military action or deterrence and containment seem really bad, so there's got to be some other way. Uh, so what are the other ways that people have suggested? Well, some say maybe we can just stop Iran's program through covert action. Maybe we can just continue to conduct cyber attacks and sabotage their facilities, and there have been these assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists. Um, so maybe we can just keep doing stuff like that. The international community can do, do stuff like that. And maybe that will stop Iran. Uh, 
Uh, but what I show in the book is that these kind of uh, mysterious activities and accidents have been happening to Iran's nuclear program for years. But every three months, if you just look at the IEA reports, every three months Iran's capabilities continue to increase. So despite all of the stuff that's been thrown at them, their, their program advances. So I think it's possible that their program would have advanced more precipitously if it hadn't been for this stuff. But I think what that also shows is that on its own, covert action will not be enough. Uh, second, some people argue maybe we can have a Japan model as an option. And the Japan model option is that, um, like Japan, uh, maybe Iran could have an advanced nuclear capability, essentially have everything it needs to build nuclear weapons if it wanted to, essentially be kind of a screwdriver's turn or two away, uh, but that Iran won't do it, Iran won't turn the final two screws, and we would just live with it. Uh, and I argue that that's not a serious option either because uh, there's really no reason to believe that Iran would stop short. Once Iran was a screwdriver two uh, or two away, once it was at the point where the West could no longer physically stop it, I think there's no reason to believe that Iran would refrain from building nuclear weapons. So what I argue is that the Japan model very quickly would become the North Korea model. A uh, third, what about regime change? Some people argue regime change is an option. And usually people aren't talking about uh, George W. Bush style regime change where we invade the country, but rather uh, just wait this government out. Maybe this government can't stay in power forever. Maybe there'll be some kind of new revolution in Iran. Maybe some new government will come to power that will be more uh, willing to deal with us on the nuclear program. We'll, we'll give up the nuclear program. And I argue that that would be nice if, if we could get it, but that there's really no sign that this government is, is going to fall anytime soon and that the nuclear clock is ticking much faster than the regime change clock. And so we're going to have to make difficult decisions on how to deal with the nuclear program before any new government comes to power. Okay. So having dismissed the non-starters, then I get into the serious options. And the first one is diplomacy. Uh, and so as I said at the outset, I think if we could solve this diplomatically, that would be by far the best option. Uh, and in fact, the longest chapter in the book is on diplomacy. So again, kind of contrary to this idea that uh, some people have jumped to, that I give short shrift to diplomacy or argue that the military option uh, is the best option. Um, so I talk about the, the history of negotiations with Iran from 2002 up until the interim deal. Uh, I talk about the various uh, designs of possible comprehensive deals. I talk about a kind of ideal deal in which Iran would have no enrichment capability whatsoever, uh, which would be the best deal from the West point of view. Uh, and then I talk about this limited enrichment deal, which is uh, what it seems that we're currently pursuing, and talk about some of the advantages of that, and talk about some of the disadvantages of that. And I think there are some real disadvantages, as I pointed out before. It would still leave Iran only six months away from a nuclear weapons breakout capability. Um, so uh, I argue, oh, I also uh, talk about a diplomatic plan B, because even if this round of negotiations break down, uh, we wouldn't necessarily have to resort immediately to military force. It would depend on Iran's uh, behavior after that. So if Iran dashed immediately to build nuclear weapons, we'd have two to three months, as I talked about before. But it's also possible, perhaps even more likely, that Iran would, instead of dashing immediately to a nuclear weapon, go back to the uh, approach it was pursuing last summer before Rouhani was elected, kind of slowly building up its capabilities, slowly putting more centrifuges online, more advanced centrifuges, increasing its stockpiles of low-enriched uranium. And so this would slowly shrink uh, that dash time, in which case we'd have about a year or so uh, before we had to take uh, military action. And so I talk about a diplomatic plan B where we could engage in kind of course of diplomacy to try to get Iran back to the table one more time, try one last time to solve it diplomatically. Um, I also argue in this chapter, though, that we need to be realistic. We all hope diplomacy will work, but it might not. Uh, President Obama himself has said that there's, uh, quote, uh, or no, that the chance of a comprehensive deal is, quote, no better than 50-50. Uh, his former WMD advisor, uh, Gary Seymour, who I mentioned before, puts the chances at closer to zero. Uh, and so there has been some optimism expressed in recent weeks, but there's still a, a sizable chance that we won't be able to get a comprehensive deal. Moreover, even if we get a comprehensive deal, it wouldn't necessarily solve the problem. Again, it leaves Iran perennially six months away from a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, and something that I worry about is if we get this comprehensive deal, we declare an end to the Iranian nuclear crisis, uh, people will stop worrying about Iran, the economic <coughs> pressure will be lifted, trade will resume, world leaders will start focusing on other issues. And I think in that environment, it would be very tempting for Iran to uh, cheat on the agreement and potentially build back up its nuclear capabilities and essentially dare the international community to try to respond. I mean, after all, it took us 10 years to build the sanctions regime we currently have in place. Uh, if that were dismantled as part of a comprehensive deal, it would be very hard to reassemble that and put pressure back on Iran. So even if we get a comprehensive deal, I think there's a reasonable chance Iran would try to sneak out 
or it's at some point uh, attempt to build nuclear weapon. Okay. So if diplomacy doesn't work, if because we can't get a comprehensive deal, or we get a comprehensive deal but it breaks down, uh, what happens next? So this gets to the what is worse question. Um, so one option would be to simply give up and acquiesce to a nuclear armed Iran, allow Iran to have nuclear weapons. Uh, but a nuclear armed Iran, uh, al almost everyone agrees, uh, that it would pose a grave threat to international peace and security. Uh, first, I think it would lead to the further proliferation of nuclear weapons in the Middle East. Uh, and we shouldn't exaggerate this. I don't think every country in, in the region would immediately have nuclear weapons. But I think that over the course of 10, 20 years or so, at least one or two other countries would acquire nuclear weapons in response. Maybe Saudi Arabia, maybe Egypt, maybe Turkey. Uh, and so some of you might be saying, well, one or two countries in 10 or 20 years, that doesn't sound too bad. But that'll be cold comfort if in 10 or 20 years we're in the middle of an Iranian, Saudi, Israeli, American nuclear crisis. Uh, after all, I, I hope to be around and kicking 10 or 20 years from now. Uh, probably many of you do too uh, as well. So I think it would lead to proliferation in the region. I also think it would lead to uh, proliferation around the world. I think Iran uh, would be at risk of becoming a nuclear supplier. Uh, and my first book, a uh, book that Stephanie mentioned at the beginning, is called Exporting the Bomb, Systematic Analysis of Why Countries Have Exported Sensitive Nuclear Material and Technology in the Past. And all the analysis I've done suggests that Iran would be uh, at risk of doing that, potentially transferring uranium enrichment technology to other countries in Latin America and Asia. Uh, so it could lead to the further proliferation uh, of nuclear weapons around the world uh, that way. And in this environment, when there's uh, proliferation in the, in the region, proliferation around the world, I think the global nonproliferation regime more broadly would be weakened. Uh, countries uh, would see that the great powers, the United States, wasn't serious about enforcing nonproliferation. I think the, the regime could collapse and lead to, to widespread proliferation. Uh, second, I think that Iran would be emboldened and would become more aggressive in its foreign policy in the region. So we know right now that Iran restrains its foreign policy because it fears uh, major military retaliation from Israel or from the United States. Uh, but if it had nuclear weapons, it could feel emboldened to push harder. It would know that it could deter major mi military retaliation with its nuclear weapons through the threat of nuclear retaliation. So it could step up its support to terrorist and proxy groups, engage in more aggressive course of diplomacy in the region, essentially taking these steps to achieve its goal of becoming the most dominant state in the Middle East, which is what it says it wants to do. Uh, so in this uh, scenario, you could imagine the Middle East uh, becoming an even more crisis-prone region. Uh, and in a crisis-prone region with a nuclear-armed Iran, nuclear-armed Israel, nuclear-armed United States, in the future potentially other nuclear-armed states, I think th we'd have nuclear crises uh, every few years and a potential for nuclear war. Now, I don't think Iran's leaders are suicidal. I don't think they're going to wake up one day and say, today's a good day for nuclear war. Uh, but I do think that Iran will have geopolitical conflicts of interest with other states with other nuclear armed states. They'll get into high stakes crises, uh, just like the United States and the Soviet Union did during the Cold War. Think of Berlin, the Cuban Missile Crisis. And in these high stakes crises, there's always the risk of things spinning out of control and a nuclear exchange. So some people look back at the Cold War and think, wow, nuclear deterrence works. Uh, I look back and think we were incredibly lucky to avoid an exchange. Uh, and so if there's an arms race in the Middle East, I think that would be uh, a place where there would be danger for a nuclear exchange. Uh, so, uh, nuclear exchange in the region could very well mean the end of the state of Israel. It's a very small state. I think Israel's leaders aren't exaggerating when they say for them this is an existential issue. Uh, and once Iran has ballistic missiles capable of reaching the east coast of the United States, which the United States Department of Defense estimates could happen as soon as next year, uh, could potentially even result in a nuclear attack on, on the U.S. homeland. Uh, so, a, a lot of threats uh, posed by a nuclear-armed Iran. Now, the United States wouldn't just accept these threats. We'd put in place a, a strategy to deal with it, a kind of deterrence and containment strategy, just like we put in place a deterrence and containment strategy against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Uh, but this would require a major increase of U.S. political and military commitments to the Middle East. So it would likely uh, require signing formal defense agreements with our allies and partners in the region, potentially f signing formal uh, treaties with Saudi Arabia, with other Gulf states, uh, perhaps with Israel. Uh, so, uh, let's call a spade a spade. This would essentially be the United States promising to fight a nuclear war on Saudi Arabia's behalf, on Gulf states' behalf, on, on Israel's behalf. So during the Cold War, people asked, would the United States really be willing to trade New York for Paris? Would we really be willing to fight a, a nuclear war uh, if France were attacked? Uh, this would mean, uh, people would be asking, would the United States be willing to trade New York for Riyadh? Would we be willing to, to fight a nuclear war that risks uh, New York if, if Riyadh's attacked? Um, 
So in some ways, this is an inherently incredible threat. To increase the credibility of the threat, we would do things that we did during the Cold War in Europe and in East Asia. We would forward deploy U.S. forces uh, in the region, forward deploy U.S. nuclear weapons to make it very clear to Iran that any attack would potentially result in, in a nuclear retaliation. Uh, we'd likely have to uh, help Israel develop secure second strike capabilities. Uh, one of the risks of nuclear war would come about because it's likely that both Iran and Israel might think that they have first strike advantages. Uh, and so helping Israel to understand that it, it has a secure second strike capability, helping it potentially acquire submarine launch ballistic missiles, hardened ballistic missile silos uh, to make sure that its nuclear arsenal is survivable. Uh, and uh, so this would be a costly uh, strategy, require a major increase of commitments, and it's not like Iran would have nuclear weapons for one day. This is a strategy that would likely have to remain in place for decades, uh, as long as Iran had nuclear weapons and was hostile uh, to the United States. And I think even with that strategy, we couldn't uh, deal with many of the threats posed by a nuclear-armed Iran. I think with a deterrence and containment strategy, we could deter Iran from purposely starting a nuclear war. I think we could deter them from purposely transferring nuclear weapons to terrorist groups. But I think that many of the other threats we couldn't deal with with that deterrence and containment strategy. I think it's likely that Iran would still transfer sensitive nuclear technology. Would we will really be willing to fight a nuclear war uh, with Iran because it transferred uranium enrichment technology? Probably not. Iran's leaders would understand that and understand they could get away with it. Uh, I think we couldn't deter Iran from being emboldened. I think Iran would become more aggressive in the region, even with a deterrence and containment regime. And by definition, we can't deter uh, accidental or inadvertent nuclear war in a high-stakes crisis. Um, so it's, uh, deterring and containing a nuclear-armed Iran is not a good option. Uh, President Bush and President Obama didn't agree on a lot in foreign policy, but they both agreed that a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable. Uh, so if that's the case, if a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable, if diplomacy fails, then that leaves us with one option, uh, the military option. Uh, so in the book, I, I talk about the military option, and the military option uh, isn't uh, a good, good option either. There are many risks uh, to the military option. The question is, is it worse uh, or better than deterrence and containment if diplomacy fails? Uh, so first I talk about the Israeli military option. Uh, many people, when they think of the military option, think that Israel would do it, not the United States. Uh, the problem with the Israeli military option is they simply don't have the capabilities to, to destroy uh, Iran's key nuclear facilities. Uh, there are four key nuclear facilities. Two of them are above ground. Uh, Israel could destroy those. There are two facilities below ground. Israel might be able to get uh, one of the facilities, the Natanz facilities, with uh, some bunker-busting bombs that the United States has provided. But even with those bombs, there's no way Iran could get the facility at Qom. It's buried into the side of a mountain. It's under 295 feet of rock. Uh, so the Israeli option, in my view, is, is not a good option. I think that's one thing that both hawks and doves in the United States agree on. The Israeli military option is not a good one. Uh, the U.S. military option is, is much better, simply because the United States does have the capability to destroy Iran's key nuclear facilities, even the facility at Qom. Uh, so this would set Iran's nuclear program back. It's difficult to estimate uh, exactly how much time it would buy. Um, most estimates you see range somewhere from three to seven years. Uh, but this is a worst-case estimate. Uh, these are estimates uh, assuming that Iran decides to immediately rebuild and doesn't encounter any significant obstacles. But if you start to assume that politics and geopolitics happens, uh, that timeline becomes much longer. Uh, so one of the things I talk about in the book is I look at the four countries historically who have had their nuclear facilities attacked. Uh, Nazi Germany during World War II, Iran uh, had its nuclear facilities attacked during the Iran-Iraq War, Iraq had its facilities attacked during the Iran-Iraq War, uh, the Israelis followed up with a strike of their own, and then the United States and a coalition uh, followed up with strikes of their own. And then Syria in 2007 had its nuclear uh, reactor attacked from Israel. So one of the things I point out is that in all of those cases, the countries conducting the attack thought they'd only buy a limited amount of time. But in every case, kind of unforeseen events, events that were completely unimaginable at the time, uh, came to pass that prevented those countries from developing nuclear weapons, and none of those countries have uh, nuclear weapons today. Um, so at a minimum, a U.S. Uh, strike would buy a few years, but I think it's much more likely that politics and geopolitics would happen, and Iran wouldn't acquire nuclear weapons in a politically meaningful time frame. Uh, now there are risks uh, to military action, to be sure, most notably Iranian military retaliation. Uh, but it's important not to exaggerate those. Many people argue that it would lead to World War III or to a broader regional war. And as I talk about in the book, it's really hard to imagine uh, how, that would, how that would play out. Uh, so first, you need to focus on Iranian capabilities. And Iran doesn't have a uh, conventional military to speak of. Uh, rather, they've been investing in these asymmetric capabilities. Uh, so they've been investing in ballistic missiles, ties with terrorist and proxy groups, 
and this irregular IRGC navy that they could use to cause problem in, in the Persian Gulf and potentially even close the Strait of Hormuz. Um, so that's what Iran uh, could do. It could conduct ballistic missile attacks, it could sponsor terrorist attacks, and it could harass and attack ships uh, in the Persian Gulf. But then we also have to ask, what would Iran do? Uh, so put yourself in the shoes of Iran's supreme leader. Um, you wake up one morning and your nuclear facilities have been destroyed, but your country is intact, your military is intact, your, your government's intact, your foremost objective is to protect uh, your theocratic regime. Uh, what do you do? On one hand, you'd have to strike back to some degree. Uh, you'd, wanna, uh, you'd look like a wimp if you didn't uh, strike back. You'd look like a wimp domestically and internationally. On the other hand, you wouldn't want to pick a full-scale war with the United States, the one country on earth that could ensure that your military is destroyed, ensure that your regime comes to an end. And so uh, most Iranian military analysts assess that in the event of a strike, Iran's supreme leader would aim for some kind of calibrated response, try to strike back, but not too hard. And so I think we could play on our Iran's fears. In fact, in the book, I talk about a strategy the United States could use to try to mitigate some of the negative consequences of a strike. And one of the things I talk about is that we could issue a deterrent threat to Ar Iran's leaders, either publicly or through various back channels, and make it very clear that if it gets to this point, we're only interested in destroying the nuclear facilities, not in overthrowing the, the regime or invading the country, but that if Iran strikes back too hard, if it closes the Strait of Hormuz, if it conducts a major terrorist attack in the United States, or other things that we simply couldn't live with, then that we would be willing to escalate the conflict. And I think in that way we can play on what many people believe is the Supreme Leader's uh, inclination anyway, and trade essentially uh, Iran's nuclear program, what President Obama has called one of the leading security challenges to the country, for uh, a calibrated Iranian retaliation. So that's not a, not a good option. Um, we're still dealing with uh, taking military action against another country, another country retaliating. Uh, so what about this what is worse question? Uh, so what I do in the book, the penultimate chapter, compares these two options side by side. And there are many ways to do this. The way that I do it is identify 12 of America's most important national security objectives. Uh, so the United States not wants to protect the homeland. Uh, the United States wants to prevent nuclear proliferation, combat international terrorism, protect our allies. Um, list 12 of these kind of interests. And then I go through and compare these two scenarios, a military strike on Iran or deterring and containing a nuclear armed Iran, and ask how they affect these various interests. And one of the things that I show is that uh, there are several interests that are clearly better protected by a strike. Uh, nuclear proliferation, for example, I think is, is clearly better protected by a strike. Uh, there are many other interests that seem to be pure toss-ups. So for example, the United States would like uh, to maintain regional stability in the Middle East. Well, a strike is clearly worse for stability in the short term, taking military action against another country and retaliation. But uh, there's a good argument to be made that over the long term, uh, acquiescing to a nuclear armed Iran would be worse for regional stability. As Iran becomes emboldened, it leads to a nuclear arms race in the region, nuclear crises. Uh, so it's really hard to say uh, which uh, option is better for protecting re um, regional stability. What becomes clear, though, is that there's clearly not a single interest that's better protected in both the short term and the long term by acquiescing to a nuclear armed Iran. And in fact, I, I tell a story about when I was working as an advisor on Iran policy, and I did a, a major uh, briefing on this issue to uh, senior defense and, and civilian and military leaders at the Pentagon. And uh, defense officials like to receive their information in PowerPoint slides. So the final slide in the presentation was a chart showing these two options uh, and showing across these various interests. And options, uh, interest, I'm sorry, that were improved in a various scenario were colored green. Interests that um, remained roughly the same, uh, kind of were neutral, uh, were colored yellow. And interests that were harmed in a particular scenario were colored orange or red, depending on their levels of severity. Uh, and two things stood out to everybody in the room. Uh, first, there wasn't a lot of green, a lot of orange and red. Uh, th these weren't good options. Uh, but the second thing that stood out to everybody in the room is that the nuclear armed Iran side of the chart was noticeably darker than the military strike side of the chart. Uh, so uh, the military strike, uh, the risks of a military strike paled in comparison, uh, quite literally in this case, to the risks of a nuclear armed Iran. And in fact, at the end of the briefing, the foremost, uh, the senior most official in the room looked me straight in the eye and said, well, if you're right, this is a no-brainer. Uh, and I think, I think that's uh, correct. I think these are bad options that we should try to solve this diplomatically, but if it gets to the point of choosing, uh, conducting a limited strike on Iran's key nuclear facilities is less bad than living with the threats posed by a nuclear armed Iran for years to come. So when uh, the Obama administration makes these statements that a nuclear armed Iran is unacceptable, we'll do whatever it takes, uh, 
I don't think it's just bluster. I think it's based on sound analysis, and I do think it's what's in the best interest of the country. Uh, I'll just finish up by telling a short story. In uh, 2006, I was in Singapore for a conference, a scenario planning conference. Uh, so there were academics, journalists, policymakers from uh, Asia, Europe, United States. And uh, this conference was, we considered these various scenarios for future states of the world. And the idea was to think creatively, to have new insights, to kind of stress and strain our assumptions about the way the world worked, and that we could take these insights back into our day jobs. And uh, one of the scenarios centered around a global financial crisis. Uh, now remember, this is 2006. So we had all these educated people in the room, all these people who closely followed the international economy, international politics, uh, and the session was a complete bust. Uh, everybody in the room said, you know, this is just implausible. Uh, we haven't had a crisis like this since the Great Depression. Uh, we've learned our lesson. We have enlightened policies in place. The global economy is so much different now. It's interconnected. It's globalized. Uh, so they're willing to stretch their minds, but this was going too far. A global financial crisis, simply impossible. And then, of course, global financial crisis hit the very next year. Uh, so I fear that we, uh, the expert community and also the general public, are in danger of being similarly Pollyannish about nuclear war. Uh, I've decided to spend the first 10 years or so of my academic career studying nuclear proliferation because I do believe that uh, nuclear proliferation poses a, a grave threat to international peace and security. Again, I look at the Cold War and don't say, wow, deterrence works. I think, wow, we were lucky to avoid a nuclear exchange. You know, so are we really willing to bet the security of uh, the international system, the security of the country, on the argument that something hasn't happened in 70 years, therefore it will never happen again? Uh, I, for one, as somebody who spent a lot of time thinking about nuclear weapons, would be surprised if nuclear weapons aren't used again sometimes in, sometime in my lifetime. And I think if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, leading potentially to an arms race in the region in response, I think that that would be one of the prime candidates for the next nuclear war, potentially even one that could result in an attack on the United States. So we often say that nuclear proliferation poses one of the gravest threats to international peace and security. Uh, we often say that it poses one of the greatest threats to the United States. Uh, but if that's the case, we have to be willing to do what it takes uh, to stop it. And in principle, uh, military strikes on nuclear facilities and proliferating states has to be one of the tools uh, in our toolbox. So I think if it uh, gets to that point and the United States must take tough action against Iran, I think this would be consistent with America's approach to international security over the past century. The United States has often been called upon uh, to take tough action, to deal with threats to international security. Uh, and the result, I think, has been, uh, the, in general, international stability and prosperity for much of the international system. And I think dealing with the Iranian nuclear challenge is no different, and now is not the time to shirk our responsibilities. So, thank you. Uh, I was disturbed by the title of your book, and then uh, was more encouraged as you progressed to indicate that you were uh, favorably disposed towards diplomatic efforts. But then, as I listen to you, you're pretty cynical about the diplomatic efforts, and you say even if uh, we proceed down that path, Iran can break out and within a few weeks uh, or months have a nuclear weapon, and they're likely to cheat. So. You're really poo-pooing the whole idea of, di of diplomatic efforts. That's my first point. Secondly, why aren't you as concerned about North Korea mm. as you are about Iran? What's the big difference here? We've come to accept that North Korea has nuclear weapons. They'll, they'll eventually, they can hit our allies now with missiles, and they have nuclear weapons to do it with. So we've. We've gotten used to having that situation, but for some reason, with Iran, it's totally unacceptable. And finally, I didn't think you really um, paid enough attention to the, some of the other detrimental effects if we attack. Mm -hmm. Israel, uh, Iran will certainly go full, for, full force forward with the nuclear weapons program. Any doubt that that was going to be the case will be removed. That, that will be a prime objective. And secondly, this will unite the Iranian people behind the government. And uh, I think that's a huge disadvantage. Uh, so first, um, you said that I, uh, I poo-pooed the diplomatic option, I think, the uh, language you used. So um, you know, t to be absolutely clear, I do think the diplomatic option uh, is the best option. Um, but I think we have to be realistic. There's um, a, a good chance that we won't get a comprehensive deal. President Obama says less than 50-50. 
Um, and uh, as I said, that it's possible that even if we get a deal that that would unravel. So I think you know, better than even chance that diplomacy won't solve this problem. But even if, if that's the case, I think we should pursue it because you know, one of the advantages of military strike is that it buys time, but diplomacy also buys time. Uh, as long as we're negotiating, as long as this interim deal is in place, Iran's not making that final dash to a nuclear weapon. Uh, and um, if we get a comprehensive deal, it's going to mean, I think, that the international community needs to maintain laser focus on Iran essentially forever to make sure that it's not uh, to detect any uh, attempt to break out and then to respond to any attempt to break out. Um, and so uh, I think it's fragile, but again, as long as we can keep that in place, uh, we're uh, delaying Iran's nuclear capability, and I think that's a good thing. So uh, again, I think it's the best way forward. I just think we have to be realistic that it's probably not a, a permanent solution in, in my mind, but we can use it to buy time and, and should use it to buy time. Uh, second on North Korea. Um, so I think the main difference between Iran and North Korea isn't Israel. I think that it's in North Korea it's already too late. Uh, North Korea is estimated to have uh, between six and a dozen nuclear weapons. Uh, we don't know where they are, uh, so we don't have any uh, real military option there. Uh, we did have a military option in 1994. Uh, many people, uh, the United States, President Clinton seriously considered a strike on North Korea in 1994. Um, many people advocated uh, for it. And some of those people who advocated for it said, uh, have said recently that they were right, that we should have taken action in 1994, uh, that North Korea has led to many problems over the past uh, 10 years, and that if we had taken action, we wouldn't have to deal with those. So North Korea has transferred nuclear technology. It's helped uh, Syria uh, build a nuclear reactor. North Korea has been more aggressive since acquiring nuclear weapons. It's attacked South Korea, attacked a South Korean warship, atta uh, shelled a South Korean island. Uh, North Korea is engaged in nuclear threats against our allies, uh, which makes assuring our allies in the region much harder. And it even engaged in nuclear threats against us. You might remember last year it threatened to nuke Los Angeles and Austin, Texas, of, of all places, and, and a few other things. Uh, so I think if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, these are all the things that we would have to worry about. Iran would likely transfer nuclear technology. Iran would likely uh, become more aggressive, potentially attacking its neighbors, likely engage in, in nuclear threats. And we haven't even seen the full range of consequences from a nuclear armed North Korea. It's only been uh, less than 10 years. 2006 was their first test. So we could still have a nuclear war involving North Korean nuclear weapons. And so I think these are all the things that we should worry about with Iran. And the main difference is that it's not too late for Iran. It's too late for North Korea. Uh, we can do something about Iran. Uh, in terms of the cost of taking military action, there, there are a lot of costs, and um, only had you know, 30 minutes or so here and go into the other costs uh, in the book. So I would uh, encourage you to, to look at that. Uh, so uh, you said if there's any doubt that Iran would build nuclear weapons presently, that a strike would convince them to go all the way. Uh, many people make that argument. Uh, my view and what I argue in the book is that I think Iran's already made that decision. Uh, and there's no way really to explain their behavior over the past 10 years except uh, if they've decided to build nuclear weapons. And, you know, the Supreme Leader has been building up this program for decades. It's kind of, I think, naive for us to assume that he hasn't thought long and hard about what, what he's doing and what he intends to do with it. So um, the second thing I, I point out in the book is that if that's a concern, that can be mitigated completely by the timing of a strike. So if we strike tomorrow night, then there is a danger that if they're somewhat on the fence, that that'll change their mind. But what I argue in the book is that we should actually time it according to what the real red lines are. So if Iran is approaching this one bomb's worth of material that is the real military red line for us, that's when we should take uh, military action. So if Iran's enriching to 90 percent, if Iran kicks out IEA inspectors, at that point it'll be clear that they are dashing to a nuclear weapon, that if we don't do anything they will build nuclear weapons. Uh, and so taking military action will be the only thing that even creates the possibility of a non-nuclear outcome. Um, Uniting the Iranian people, I think that's uh, almost certain that in the short term it would create a rally around the flag effect, that the regime would become more popular. Um, the other thing we know about rally around the flag effects, though, is that they tend to be relatively short-lived. And many people who understand Iranian domestic politics much better than me, I come at this more from a non-proliferation perspective, from a U.S. military strategy, uh, foreign national security strategy point of view. Uh, but those who know Iranian domestic politics very well say it'll create a rally around the flag effect in the short term, but over the long term it'll create opportunities for opposition figures to criticize the government for mismanaging the, the problem to this point that it led to an armed attack on the country, that it led to Iran uh, having its nuclear program destroyed. And then the other thing I would just point out is that, uh, you know, we can't just look at the cost on one side of the ledger or the other, we have to compare them. Uh, so one of the things I do in the book is say, what does acquiring nuclear weapons do to Iranian domestic politics? And I think acquiring nuclear weapons also strengthens the regime. 
It allows them to deter a foreign attack. It allows them to make the argument to domestic publics that they steered the ship of state through this international crisis, uh, maintain the nuclear program, and is one of only 10 states on Earth to become a nuclear power. Uh, and that, I think, is a, an effect that would be locked in potentially longer, uh, because uh, no, there's only been one country that's ever given up nuclear weapons. Iran would likely have nuclear weapons for a long time, and would reap the international and domestic benefits of that over time. So um, uh, difficult issues here, but again, my, my own view, taking all these issues into account is, while bad, uh, a strike is, is less bad than acquiescing. Again, yeah, thank you so much for the, the comments about the Cold War and how that ended. Uh, that's being pretty lucky. I think that's a very uh, poignant point to make. Um, I also was very interested to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on uh, this demand issue that you brought up. Um, I feel like you could, um, if you could maybe expand on that a little bit more. Um, if there, are, uh, I guess, if there are ways that the U.S. can, you know, in its geopolitical calculus in the Middle East, uh, work to reduce the demand. Um, Again, if you could just address that a little bit more, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, um, I, I guess a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one is uh, there are different factions within Iranian domestic politics, and I think um, a lot of the my talk, I talk of Iran as a coherent entity, and often in foreign policy we talk about states as uh, coherent entities. But there are different factions in Iran. So there are the kind of hardliners in Iran, in the IRGC, uh, in the parliament, uh, who very strongly believe that Iran uh, should be the most dominant state in the region. Uh, needs to acquire nuclear weapons in order to do that. Uh, doesn't want a diplomatic settlement, actually sees a diplomatic settlement with the great Satan, is, which is what they call the United States, as, as threatening to, to Iran and what it stands for. That they, they think Iran stands for resistance to the West, resistance to the international community. They see negotiations uh, and a deal as, as something to be avoided. Uh, on the other hand, you do have uh, more moderate uh, forces in Iran. And I think uh, Rouhani, the current president, and Zarif, the current foreign minister, represent that point of view. Uh, I think they uh, think that uh, international isolation is not good for Iran. Uh, they understand that the economy is being badly damaged, and so they uh, would like to get uh, economic relief, and I think that they are willing to put some curbs on the nuclear program in order to get that. Uh, but the important thing to point out is that the supreme leader uh, is the ultimate decision maker in the Iranian uh, system. And so the supreme leader is li hearing all these viewpoints and making the final decision. And historically, uh, the supreme leader uh, has been more in the hardline camp uh, than in the moderate camp. Uh, and so I think, uh, if I try to, to read the Supreme Leader, I think what he's trying to do here is have his cake and eat it too. Uh, he'd like to have uh, nuclear weapons, or at least as advanced a nuclear program as possible, and get the sanctions relief. And I think that's probably the, the, what Iran's trying to achieve in these negotiations. Uh, so in terms of, of addressing the demand, um, you know, in foreign policy, we often talk about using carrots and sticks, uh, promising carrots or inducements for good behavior, threatening sticks uh, for, for bad behavior. And what many people have looked at this problem have, have said is that uh, we really have to rely on sticks here because when you look at benefits, there's nothing that we can promise Iran that's more valuable than a nuclear weapons capability. Uh, there's nothing we can promise them that's more valuable than this capability that would allow them to deter foreign attack, become the most dominant state in the region. Uh, so therefore, the key is, is the sticks, uh, threatening that without a deal, we'll be able to crank up the economic pressure and at the end of the day, um, take military action. So um, I, I think I agree with that point of view, that, that the key to, to addressing this issue isn't addressing demand, because I don't think there's anything we could possibly promise Iran that's more valuable uh, than becoming the most dominant state. We've tried peaceful nuclear technology. We've tried promising other things. They haven't been interested. So I think the key is, is making it clear that we can threaten more economic pain and, and in the end military action if they don't accept this deal that they, they don't really want. I want to offer a couple of nuances here. First of all, I like your analysis as, a, as such, but we all know the story of 1001 nights when Seherat Sade was buying time. Why she told the stories for 1001 nights she wanted to buy time so that she doesn't get killed. With the Iranian nuclear crisis, it depends where you start. But uh, my clock starts somewhere in 2002. So we have by July 20th, depending where you put your line, 4,001 night. And I think that what has happened to us, we became a hostage, a second hostage crisis with the Iran. And I see there uh, actually a thing in between that Iran really doesn't dash to nuclear weapon manufacturing because a small country with the 
limited resources, it doesn't make sense. But they go just to the limit. And then they do exactly all this, what you talk, you know, how to deal with the Middle East and how to embolden, etc. And this is very difficult for the international community to deal with because Iran claims that it's their legal right to do X, Y, Z. And as long as there's no proof that they have violated their safeguards or NPT undertakings, which they refuse to talk. So uh, the international community is in a little bit in bind here. And when I look at today, two months, three months, six months. First of all, when I work in the UN and IAEA, six months is an extremely small period of time if you want the international community to act. We should keep that one in mind. The second thing is that what we really know about the Iranian nuclear program. All these numbers with my friend uh, David, and I have been a little bit complot with him, so are putting out. This is based on the numbers we know. But there are also numbers which we may not know. And therefore, this next deal, whether it's another interim deal or it's a longer deal, actually has to address that part to bring clarity, to make sure that the Iranian declarations are complete. So much I like, like IAEA, I have still a blue heart pumping here for the UN. But we should not leave it only to the IAEA inspections and additional protocol and safeguards verification. The real transparency which uh, President Rouhani was again advocating two days ago really goes much further. It has to be the way it was in 1960s between US and Russia, where information was provided to the other party in such a way that it was able to verify those statements without going to the country. So this is a new transparency, a new challenge, which in my view should be part of this, whatever it is, it's an interim deal or final deal. But I think it's a great book, but I have not yet read it, but I will do it during the weekend. Well, thank you for those uh, comments, Ali, and, and thank you so much for coming. Um, so I think you raised an excellent point that if we can do things in a comprehensive deal to get even greater transparency, more than what the uh, IEA can provide, that that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, on, on this challenge that you uh, proposed of Iran stopping just short of the line and, and staying there, uh, I think that is a, a possible option, but I, th I think that's not a long-term stable option, because I just don't see why Iran would, would stop short when it got that close. Uh, because, uh, again, if Iran's major goals are to be able to deter foreign attack, just having advanced nuclear facilities uh, doesn't allow you to deter foreign attack. Having nuclear weapons and the ability to retaliate with nuclear weapons does. Uh, to become the most dominant state in the Middle East, again, I think having an advanced nuclear program doesn't allow them to do that. Japan has an advanced nuclear program. It's not the most dominant state in Asia. Uh, so uh, my own assessment is that uh, that might be uh, a stopping point somewhere along the way. But if it gets to that point, that at some point Iran will cross. It won't voluntarily stop short. But reasonable people can disagree. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.